Hello, my name is uh, Dr. Ron Charles. Pleasure having you with us today. You know, the uh, life of David is one of those that um, really gets a lot of attention uh, as far as the Bible is concerned. And there's not a lot about him in the secular world, although there is enough to show that the Bible was absolutely correct when they wrote about him. But uh, David went through his own trials, his own struggles. And uh, we'll be reading out of uh, 2 Samuel today. So if you have your Bible with you, we turn to 2 Samuel, the fifth chapter. And we'll begin to read at verse number six. It says this, and the king, this is King David, and his men went to Jerusalem unto the Jebusites, the inhabitants of the land, which spake unto David, saying, Except thou take away the blind and the lame, uh, thou shalt not come in hither, thinking David cannot come in hither. Now what this means is that the inhabitants of the city there in Jerusalem told David that, uh, you know, you're trying to conquer us, but we can defend this city with just the blind and the lame and still defeat you. And But uh, let's continue. Nevertheless, David took the stronghold of Zion, and the same is the city of David. And David said uh, on that day, Whosoever getteth up to the gutter and smiteth the Jebusites and the lame and the blind uh, that are uh, hated at David's soul, he shall be chief and captain, or chief and captain of my army. Wherefore, they said, the blind and the lame shall not come hither into the house of David. So David dwelt in the fort and called it the city of David. And David built round about it from Milo to inward. And David went in and grew great. And the Lord of hosts was with him. The Jebusites had been a thorn in the, in the side of the, of the Jews or the Hebrews for quite some time. And the very first uh, record we have of the Jebusites is a Hittite uh, uh, document. And the Hittites uh, lived up in what is now present day central Turkey. And then along with those people in the far eastern part of what is now Turkey was the Hureans. And they got together so they, they intermarried, and the intermarrying of those um, uh, of that group uh, produced another uh, society. That society was the Heuritians, and they then went down to Cana. And when they were in Cana, they interbreeded or intermarried with the giant nations that were down there, and the product of that uh, union, uh, they became known as the Jebusites. And so uh, some of these Jebusites, uh, they came out to be uh, giants and some regular, uh, regular normal sized men, but they did have that giant uh, rebellious uh, bloodline within them. Now, when Joshua went in with the children of Israel after their uh, exodus from Egypt, they, uh, they were commissioned by God to drive out the inhabitants of the land. And one of those inhabitants were, uh, were the Jebusites. Now, the Jebusites had settled uh, around this mountain that they call Mount Zion. And uh, around that mountain, they, they, they basically put their village, um, uh, they, they, they created their own village, and they called that Salem. And, um, but then there was a fortification on top of the mountain. Now, the mountain itself was probably about a thousand feet higher than the rest of the area. And it had a, a flat top, and it was about 60 acres up there. And so they, uh, they felt like that was the, the ideal location to put, the, uh, put a fort or a fortification that would protect the city and protect the entire area. So they built this on top of the, top of the mountain, and that became known as the stronghold of the Jebusites. And it was very powerful. As a matter of fact, out of all the forts, castles, 
um, uh, military fortifications in all of Cana, it was the most powerful. And it was one that was, um, that was most uh, noteworthy as far as holding out against any type of siege. The, um, the tribe of Judah tried to take it and they were not successful. The tribe of Benjamin tried to take it, they were not successful. And so finally they just decided, we'll just leave these Jebusites alone. Now, the, the, uh, the fortification itself was called Jabez because that was the uh, Jabez meaning um, the, uh, the power of the Jebusites. And so um, that entire region then, you had the village of Salem and then you had the stronghold of Jabez. So the entire area together was called Jerusalem. Uh, Jabez, Salem together. And uh, during the time of, uh, of Abraham, uh, that area became well known because of Melchizedek. And he was the priest as well as the ruler of the village or the city of Salem. And uh, so that's where uh, he fits into this story. But over a thousand years passed from the time of, of Joshua until the time of David. And throughout that entire area, that entire time span of over a thousand years, the Jebusites were never confronted and they were never, uh, uh, they, they were never in a position of being threatened. Uh, being threatened by Jews or anyone else because of the tremendous um, fortification they had there of Jabez as well as uh, the people of Salem. And the people who lived in Salem were Jebusites. But the tribe of Benjamin and the tribe of Judah also lived in the area. And so there was a line that was, uh, that was drawn between the, the, the people. And uh, the tribe of Judah lived north of that line, which was right on the outskirts of the village of Salem. And the people of uh, uh, Benjamin lived uh, uh, in another line that was south of the village and south of Jabez or the fortification of the Jebusites. Then David came on the scene and God told him to defeat the Jebusites and drive them out. Do not mess with them. Do not have anything to do with them. Do not sign a peace agreement with them. Drive them out. And so after a couple of different uh, attempts uh, which David was and his men were not successful in driving them out, David settled for second best. Rather than establishing the city of David or Jerusalem as his, uh, as his headquarters and as his royal city, he went to Hebron. And there for the next several years, uh, he, was, he did second best and he set up his kingdom and set up the royal city in Hebron. And then he was satisfied, thought that he was appeasing God um, for the next few years, uh, putting up brush fires all over his kingdom. Uh, there were not uh, significant uprisings. They were just kind of rebel re uh, local rebellions that David had to put down. But then one day, God spoke to David very, very, um, uh, like, like a boss man. He says, David, I'm tired of you monkeying around with these Jebusites. I want you to attack them and get rid of them once and for all. And this is the plan. And God gave him the plan on how to do it. And that was to send his army up on the uh, drainage, uh, the drainage gutters of the fortification of Jabez and get into the fortification that way. And once the fortification falls, then so will the village fall also. So that's exactly what he did. And David and uh, Joab, the, his general, um, conquered that 
fortification of uh, the Jebusites, that that could not be conquered, that that could not uh, be sub uh, subjugated. It was. It was brought to total and complete defeat by David, Joab, and his men, and they were very successful with it. David had never been called great by God. He had never been in a position where God would say, your kingdom would last forever, and your uh, legacy will last far longer than, uh, than your name and than your life. But after the defeat of the Jebusites, in verse number 10 of the same chapter, we see this. And David went on and grew great, and the Lord God of hosts was with him. Now, that's the first time that those statements have been used for David. And so once David accomplished what God had told him to do several years before, and what God wanted to be done all the way back to the time of Joshua and the, uh, uh, and the driving out of the inhabitants of Canaan. Once that was got done, then God said, David, you are great. Your legacy will last forever. And today, the line of David is still talked about more than any other of the royal lines of, the, of Judah or Israel, even more so than Solomon, more than Jehoshaphat, more than Hezekiah, more than any other king who has ever ruled the Jewish people. David is the one that says, you're in on more and, um, and, uh, and, and more easily and more dynamically than any other line that they have. And it's only because David paid attention to what God said and did what God told him to do. All of us today have our own Jebusite fortifications. Some of that stuff that is in our lives, it could be a, a bad habit. It could be personality, a character problems. Maybe we can say that, well, that's just me. That's just my personality. You know, I, I inherited that from my dad. I inherited that from my grandmother. And, you, you, you know, when you accept me, you accept me with all my faults. And so all of us have our own fortification of the Jebusites. And all of us have those things with this in us that we wish we didn't have and would like to get rid of it. But we just have not come to grips with the fact that we need to get rid of it today, right now. And because of that, then we are still a step slower than greatness. It seems pretty obvious that in order to be great in the kingdom of God, if you're using David as an example, then you have to get rid of the Jebusite strongholds in your life. You have to get rid of that thing that is holding you back. That thing that perhaps has been a part of you for many, many years, has been a part of you your entire life. And many times when we do this thing or get involved with it, uh, then we feel bad about it. We, we say, okay, well, you know, I'll, 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 God, I'll catch up with you next time. I'll, uh, we'll, we'll get this resolved. But it seems to never get resolved. The Jebusite stronghold seems to always be there and seems to always stand in the way for greatness in the kingdom of God, the greatness that God wants us to be, the greatness that God wants you to be seems to come to fall short because we have not yet taken care of the Jebusite stronghold that is very much 
in evidence in our life. And it stands like a castle on top of a mountain. Everyone can see it. Everyone knows that it's part of you and everyone acknowledges it, but it's still not something God wants you to have in your life. It's something that is obvious to everybody, but it's also something that needs to be eliminated. It needs to be no longer a part of your life. David got together with God, and God said, this is how you conquer. This is how you conquer that stronghold. You approach it from, uh, from the direction that I tell you you must approach it. You can't hit it head on. If you hit it head on, you'll be overwhelmed. You can't, uh, you, you can't use uh, the world's method of dealing with these things because it's too big. It's too powerful. And you cannot overcome it by using the world's means and methods. You got to use God's means and God's methods. And when you use his methods, then you're successful. God told David to go up through the, the gutter. I'll go up through uh, the, the area that is, uh, uh, th that is not well known, the area that is not, um, uh, uh, that you can't see it right away. It is something that, that, is, uh, is, that is hidden from everyone else, but you know that it's there. The only way you can find that is communication with God. And so if you're serious about attacking your Jebusite stronghold, if you're really serious about it, then get serious with God and say, Heavenly Father, I need to get rid of this thing in my life. Everybody knows it. Everybody sees it. But I know that it's preventing me from being the ruler of me. And I know this is coming between me and you. And it's preventing me to be great in the kingdom of God. So now, Lord, help me. Help me and let me be subject to you and to your will and to your means and methods of taking down this stronghold. It takes lots of prayer and lots of us listening to God once we do go to him in prayer. And he will give you the answer. He'll show you what to do. He'll show you the method to take. The method to take to control this fortification and to conquer this stronghold. And it may not be uh, what you expect. It may be a totally different arena that you have to go into to, uh, to find the means and the method to overcome it. But you can do it. You will do it with God's direction, with God's uh, leadership. It can be done. And so when you approach this stronghold, approach it from the, uh, from the, uh, from the direction of I am strong enough to take this. I am powerful enough to overcome this Jebusite fortification. I am the general that's going to be in charge of my own life. The general that's in charge of me. I am the one that's going to take care of this. And then the Lord, well, at that moment, put you at the top of his list on overcoming the enemies in our life. And he will begin to show you either through his word, through that small voice within you, or with the uh, encouragement of other people, he will show you how to get rid of that Jebusite stronghold that's in your own life. And when you get rid of it, it's usually going to be a whole lot easier than what you originally thought it would be. That was the case with David. 
he, he didn't go up to the fortification because he was afraid it was too big. It was too powerful. It couldn't, it couldn't be conquered. And so I, I'm going to need some special equipment, some special weapons. No, he didn't. He didn't need them. He already had all that he needed and all that was required to defeat that Jebusite stronghold. So what is your stronghold today? We've already mentioned perhaps it's a bad habit. Perhaps it's something that had to do with your life before Christ. Maybe it's something that's in your personality that you've always had, that you inherited it perhaps, or certainly it runs in your family. But it's something that you don't need in your life. It's that stronghold that keeps you back. But God says, no, I've given you all the weapons you need. I've given you the directions. I've given you the blueprint. Now, all you have to do is go to prayer. Come to me and I will show you. And not only will he show us how to bring down the stronghold and how to defeat our enemy that's been there for so long, but then he will come to you and in the sweet small voice within your uh, within your being he say okay now your legacy will last forever now you are great in the kingdom of god and i will be with you i will be with you wherever you go whatever you try to accomplish i will be there and i will be holding your hand i'll be lifting you up i'll be within you to defeat any enemy that comes your way. So the first thing we do is we go to the Lord in prayer and said, okay, God, this I confess. I confess I have this Jebusite stronghold. I don't want it in my life. And I know that you don't want it in my life. So now how do I defeat it? And then once he shows you how, then get to it immediately. Get to it immediately, overcome it, and it can be, doesn't matter how powerful it is, God says, I am with you. We will overcome this thing. We will destroy it. We will make it null and void. It will never be part of you again. And that thing that was such a hindrance to David became the city of David, the home of of David. They can do the same for you. So may the Lord bless you today as you get your plans on how to defeat your Jebusite stronghold. Lord bless. Welcome to Cupid Farm. Welcome. Uh, I'm standing in the in the midst of God's Widow's Farm, which is actually a local phenomenon around here. And uh, what you're seeing are the grapes that uh, come from this farm. Um, before God gave us this acreage, originally six acres, now 10 acres, um, this plot of land was producing about uh, one ton of produce or grapes or whatever it was producing, uh, about one ton an acre. Um, but what has made this so phenomenal is that we're now averaging between nine and 10 tons an acre on whatever this planet. Now, you see the grapes here, but we also raise eggplant, both black and yellow eggplant. Uh, there's corn, okra, uh, squash. Um, we have uh, uh, tomatoes, apricots, mangoes. <clears throat> and uh, with the onions and grapes and uh, uh, onions and garlic and leeks 
and it's just um, it's just phenomenal. And what we do, we we produce this, and the widows get the first first crops, and we satisfy their needs first. And then once the widows are satisfied with the fresh produce, then we sell it. Uh, the remainder, and with the money that is uh, that we get from the produce that we sell at market, then we can buy them blankets and shoes and school supplies and clothes and things like that that they need. And if they need to go to the doctor, then we can pay for their doctor's visit, dentist visits, and so forth. And so this God's Widow's Farm produces all of that. Um, we're uh, supporting about 1,200 widows a month. Uh, plus the children, and it's um, just absolutely phenomenal what God is doing here, and it's uh, actually beyond belief the type of produce that comes off of this farm. And it's just, and uh, there's no um, chemicals, no uh, preservatives that goes into anything. It's just absolutely wonderful, and the taste is again phenomenal. God's Widow's Farm is made possible by supporters of the Cubit Foundation. You can help today by visiting cubitfoundation.org and give your gift of hope today. Dr. Ron Charles has spent over 50 years researching and uncovering the truths about the life of Jesus and information that proves the historical authenticity of the Bible. Gleaned from his years of tireless work, research, ministry, and archaeological work, and watch the pages of the Bible come to life like never before. Go to cubitfoundation.org and place your order today. All proceeds go directly to Cubit Foundation's efforts around the world.